of evolution. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. If you haven't had a chance to meet me, I'd love to meet you after the service. Uh, I've got just a couple quick announcements for you, but first I just got to try my forehead off here. A uh, little sweaty sometimes when I talk to people. <coughs> Sorry about that. You know, get nervous sometimes. There it is. <laughs> Uh, just so you know, we're watching the game tonight. Uh, theoretically, there'll be a lot of goal scored tonight, again. Uh, but come on out at 6 p.m. here. Uh, we're going to have a watch party, bring some snacks, have some fun. Dave and Sharon have jerseys. They're ready to go already. They got their time fixed up. But it's going to be a good time tonight, so come and join us for that. Um, another announcement is our very own intern, uh, Ben, who's uh, going to be preaching this morning, is wrapping up his internship in two weeks. Now, that doesn't mean he's going anywhere. As we know, he's being hired as our new youth pastor. But... Part of his internship means that he hasn't been really paid at all. For the last eight months, it's been mostly um, room and board covered and a, a few dollars here and there to help out with gas and stuff. And so we want to bless him well as he finishes up by uh, giving him a love offering to help uh, offset his living arrangements th this way. And um, also, you know, it's expensive to get degrees these days. And so we want to bless him. And so uh, we're going to be doing a love offering next week. And so... Uh, Come prepared for that, and then um, you can give, uh, whether it's on the internet or in person, and just designate to Ben Mueller. Um, and then another announcement is next weekend is uh, the weekend we've been really looking forward to and praying forward uh, for the last few months, and that's our Holy Spirit Encounter weekend. And this weekend uh, is a time set aside, especially Friday and Saturday. Uh, we'll also be having a bit on Sunday morning in the service, too, where we, we set aside space for the Spirit to give him space to move in us, to work in us, work in expectation about what he's up to. And so if you uh, want more information about that, you can always talk to one of us pastors after the service, but uh, registration actually ends today, so make sure you sign up. It's going to be just a great time of digging deeper into the things of the Spirit. Another thing going on is we have a newcomer's lunch coming up on June 5th. Now you're wondering maybe, am I a newcomer or not? If you feel like a newcomer, you're a newcomer at this stage. Uh, COVID kind of made newcomers luncheons not a thing, and so uh, we're going to be getting together. We're going to have some pizza after the service on June 5th, uh, so you can find out more about that and anything else by going to uh, the seat back in front of you, and there's a little QR code, so you just hold up your camera phone right there. Yes, I said camera phone as though it's a flip phone from the 90s, but uh, you just scan that, and it'll take you to giving uh, more information about anything. You can sign up to volunteer or well, just a plethora of things there. So, um, yeah, Thanks, that's, that's all I got. Yeah. Well, we are in our series um, through the book of Mark, continuing on, Kingdom Come. And we know that God has invited us here to gather. It's part of who we are. It's the DNA of being God's people is that we gather to worship him, to be reminded of his goodness and his provision, to tell stories to one another. But today, um, as I was thinking about this morning and um, what Ben is going to be preaching about, there is an invitation for me and for you to, to change direction. And that actually repent it means to change direction. But it's to change direction from pursuing our own kingdoms. Health, wealth, prosperity, stability, honor, all the things that we chase after. And I know that when I get distracted by all of those things and pursuing those things that um, it leaves me empty and wanting and dry. Later, we're gonna sing a new song, um, More Than Enough, and it's a, declar a declaration of trust that God is enough, that all these things we chase after are never gonna be enough, only God is. So I'm gonna read to you from my, one of my favorite passages, Isaiah 55. And invite you to stand as we begin our worship service together. 
Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Let's worship together. To every battle, Every heartbreak, to every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place. Oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. The truth, the life, I believe to every blessing, every promise, every breath I take, I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love.
Jesus, today I want to pray for all, both globally and within our own community, who are struggling and, effect and affected by the inflation we're experiencing and the rising costs of housing and food. We know there are those who are no longer able to provide for their families, and we acknowledge how overwhelming, discouraging, and stressful this is. Jesus, we ask that you would provide generously for each and each need. We acknowledge you as provider the one who graciously and generously meets our every need, and we look to you. We also ask that you would teach us how to be radically generous people, that in these days we would not be overcome by a scarcity mindset or hold tightly to what we have. Rather, would you help us to listen for how you would be guiding us to share with those around us? Would you help us to have eyes to see those in our community and our neighborhoods that we might be able to help, whether that's with our time, with the extra we might have, perhaps with our financial resources. Guide us, Holy Spirit. St. Ignatius of Loyola prayed this prayer for generosity. Eternal word, only begotten Son of God, teach me true generosity. Teach me to serve you as you deserve, to give without counting the cost, to fight heedless of wounds, to labor without seeking rest. To sacrifice myself without thought of any reward, save the knowledge that I have done your will. Amen. As we do each week, we will engage together in praying our giving liturgy. This is an opportunity to reflect with gratitude on all that we have been given and to give in response. So I will say the first part, and together you will say the second part. Father in heaven, you are generous. There is nothing we have that you have not given us. Our world thrives on greed and scarcity, on grasping for more and fearing that there won't be enough. Jesus, your kingdom is not this way. Instead, it is built on abundance. Help us, Jesus. 
Spirit, you freely give of your gifts. Empower us to do the same. Amen. This morning I am reading from Mark 10, 17 through 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father, father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. The word of the Lord. Thanks. How's everyone doing today? Good. Thought I'd ask as I uh, awkwardly unpack everything here, because it's what I'm good at, I guess, so. You, you can feel free to laugh, it's okay. I, I know I'm awkward, but I'm so glad you're here this morning. Welcome to SPAC. If you guys don't know me, my name's Ben. As Matt said before, I'm a, a youth intern here. Hi, Tara, how are you? I see you waving. Uh, and if you guys do know me, my name's still Ben. I'm the youth intern here at SPAC. Um, <laughs> and you know, this is my second time preaching uh, on the big stage in front of you guys. The first time was a few months ago. and. A lot of you probably weren't there, there's a lot of new faces here, but the last time I was joking about how awesome it was to be the intern, because I could just blame everything right on that guy there. And uh, apparently he took it to heart, because I'm going to be having his job in a couple of weeks, um, so now I'm going to be the one getting, getting blamed, so <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, jokes aside, thanks for being here today, and we are continuing our series in Mark. So uh, last week Kimberly talked about uh, who the kingdom belongs to, and she did such an incredible job of explaining that she says that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like children, meaning that, and I quote, our inclusion, therefore, has nothing to do with our status or contribution or greatness or anything we've attained or done. It's a matter of Jesus's unconditional love and acceptance. And that actually connects to where we're going today. Uh, so let's dive into uh, Mark 10, the rich, the rich and the kingdom of God, um, and see what Jesus wants to speak into our hearts today. So Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for everybody here. And I just pray that whatever you're wanting to speak, uh, that you will just pour that message into their hearts and ears, and that you'll mold their hearts to be receptive to what you have to say and uh, just help your presence be known here. Amen. Okay, so cool. So as I was preparing for this, it was actually really interesting because I've known this passage for a while, and I've read it a fair amount of times, and it's always stirred up some guilt in me. Um, I don't know if anyone else has felt this way, but when you're reading about how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, like being in a pretty wealthy um, area of the world, it's always stirred up guilt. And, uh, but as I was reading at this time, Jesus was showing me a kind of different way to look at it, a different perspective, and I'm just really excited 
to tell you all about it. So it starts with Jesus in the region of Judea, and it says that as he started on his way, a man ran up to him, falling on his knees, asking, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now there's a few things I want to unpack here, and the first is the man's actions. So this man was like literally running towards Jesus, okay? So this may not seem like a big deal, maybe it'd be a little weird to us, but back in this culture, people would not run. You would not run to people. That would be foolish, that would be weird, that would be embarrassing for you. But this man was running to Jesus, uh, which was out of the ordinary. So instead of acting calm and collected, he was acting like he had just seen Ryan Reynolds in a Walmart parking lot, and he just like booked it towards him. So he got super excited, he forgot all social cues, and as he ran towards him and got near him, he fell flat on his face. And I kind of read this and I'm like, man, how embarrassing would that be? To not only embarrass yourself in front of someone you were super excited to see, but for it to be written down, to be turned into the holy word of God, and then to be studied upon and talked about for thousands more of years to come. Like, that would be awful. <laughs> and in reality, uh, he didn't actually trip, um, which isn't as fun, but he fell on his face, and he was, in a sense, lowering himself before Jesus. And this is a sign of respect. By running and falling, and even going so far as to call Jesus a good teacher, which was very uncommon back in the day to be called a good teacher, uh, showed that this man was either so excited or desperate to meet Jesus that he forgot his usual social manners. So why the excitement? Why the desperation? Well, as he runs up falling flat on his face and he asks Jesus, like, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. So here we have the man is addressing Jesus as good, asking what he has to do, what steps he has to take in order to achieve eternal life. And Jesus does an interesting thing here because of just instead of just saying thanks or something like that, or he says, no, no one's good except God alone. And this is cool because Jesus is notices something. The man is focusing on the wrong thing. We don't know what the man's true motives are, but it seems like his only concern in this moment is what he must do to get this gift of life. And he calls Jesus a good teacher, which he's correct in doing, and sees Jesus as someone who has the solution to that problem. So when Jesus replies by saying that no one is good except God alone, he's actually redefining this man's concept of goodness. You see, William Lane says that the man was calling Jesus good by the human definition of good, which is defined by human achievement. So we see this today, like picture a good person, someone you would consider a good person in your mind, okay? Why do you think they're good? It's probably because, oh, because they do good things, they help out with charity, they're nice to people, um, they, you know, give me half-off coupons to A&W or something. It's all based on nice things they do. It's all based on their actions. And this is what this guy was thinking as well. And Lane goes on to say that this man believed that Jesus was also a good man who would also be able to assist him about how to achieve this eternal life. And Jesus saw this, so when he redirected him, he was redefining his concept of goodness by trying to make him realize that goodness is from God and God alone. We can't rely on our actions to achieve goodness, but we have to put all of our reliance on God, the source of all goodness. And then Jesus recites the commandments to him, and the man replies with, but I've followed all of these since I was a boy. So in the ancient Near Eastern times of Jesus' day, it was customary for boys at the age of 12 to take on the responsibility to obey all of the commandments, and they were actually held responsible for their performance, how well they followed all these commandments. So no wonder why this guy thought uh, that he had to do something to achieve eternal life, because that's how he was raised. It's a little bit like our culture, too. Right? Think about it. Like, when I was in grade one, I would, um, you know, learn stuff, probably, well, supposedly learn stuff, um, and then I'd have to write tests, and if I did well enough, if I performed well enough, I'd move on to grade two. Or when I went into university, if I performed well enough, I would make my way, be able to pass that class, go on to the next class to get my degree. 
Or maybe even if you're in a job and you perform well enough, you achieve enough, then you can get that nice promotion that you've been wanting. And I'm not saying that these are bad at all. These are good things. These are good things to work for, to achieve. But what I am saying is that striving to achieve all of these aren't bad, but our performance is not an accurate indicator of our value. Jesus was well aware of this performance equals worth narrative, and this is exactly why he was trying to break it down. Then it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. So I can explain what the man felt in this moment in one word. Okay? You ready for it? Oof. My heart, my feelings. Well, let's, <laughs> you're probably wondering maybe why. Maybe not. I'm going to explain anyways. So this man ran up to Jesus showing excitement to speak to him. He calls him good teacher, indicating a tremendous amount of respect. But then if you notice, he only addresses Jesus as teacher after Jesus corrects him by saying no one's good except God alone. This shows that this man is humble and willing to listen. And he kept all the commandments, showing that on top of being excited, respectful, humble, willing to listen, he's also obedient. So this guy was a good guy. He did everything right, he checked off all the boxes, and yet it still wasn't enough. Now notice it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So let's define the word love. So love in this context, the Greek word for love is agape. Okay, so agape means unconditional love. And this means that Jesus loved this man unconditionally, no matter what. He didn't have to earn it. He loved him before this man did anything. There is no earning involved in this love. And to a man who based his identity around earning, this is completely against what he was raised with. But it says that Jesus just looked at him with unconditional love. He cherished and valued him before he did anything to earn it. So with all of this, if anyone was to go to heaven, if anyone was to achieve eternal life, it was this guy, okay? If being respectful, humble, and obedient wasn't enough, though, we find out about one more crucial detail. He was wealthy. Now you're probably thinking, well, what does wealthy have to do with qualifications to get into heaven? Jesus told him, later in the story, spoiler alert, Jesus tells him to give it all up, which means it must be a bad thing, right? Well, here's the thing. So in that time period, being being wealthy was actually a sign of Jesus' divine blessing, of God's divine blessing. So if you were wealthy in those times, it was proof that God loved you, valued you, and wanted to reward you for being a good person. Insane amounts of wealth didn't have the same stigma that uh, it maybe has today. But the idea of wealth as a blessing from God comes from Proverbs 10.22, which says, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. So they interpreted it quite literally. If anyone was able to earn their way, it was this guy because he had everything, including the wealth, including the divine blessing from God. And yet Jesus says he lacks Which is funny, because this man lacked nothing, absolutely nothing. He had everything. And yet Jesus says, oh, sorry, buddy, there's still one thing you're missing. Why? Well, the man's inability to lack is the exact reason why he lacked. This fear of not having enough, of not being able to live in abundance, of not being good enough, was a barrier to the way of the kingdom, the eternal life that Jesus wants all of us to experience. And here's the thing, gaining life with Jesus is not about what we do, because that makes it about us. Eternal life is that not a reward, because a reward is something you get in response to something you've done. Life with Jesus isn't a reward, it's a gift. And a gift is not something you earn, it's not a response to something you've done, but something you receive freely without doing anything for it. And this is why the guy had it all wrong. You see, performance culture was so hardwired into his brain that he thought it was up to him to achieve eternal life, but in reality, it's in Jesus' court. It's all in Jesus' court. Jesus wasn't asking him to give up all of his wealth because wealth wasn't necessarily bad. Wealth is wealth. It's neutral. 
Jesus was asking the man to give up his wealth because it was his barrier to receiving the gift of eternal life. So if you remember Kimberly's sermon last week, she said that G, uh, children in Jesus' time had no rights, they had no status, and they didn't have a lot of value because they didn't work like adults did, and they couldn't really contribute to society in the same way. But Jesus said that the kingdom belongs to those who are like children, people without much to contribute, or maybe without any accomplishments or any status. The rich man in this story is literally the antithesis of that, the exact opposite. He had significance, he had status, he had wealth, he had power, he had the ability to contribute and more. But his wealth was most important. He relied on it, wasn't willing to give it up, as we can see later on. And that's why, and just notice also that Jesus didn't ask him to sell his possessions because he would have got some money back for them. No, Jesus said, give it away to the poor. Because by giving it away to the poor, Jesus knew that this man was never going to get anything back. But he would also be helping and aligning with kingdom values. Before we move on, though, I want to address what is eternal life. So I've been talking about it. This guy's been asking for it. And maybe some people are confused. I was. (laughs) So I'm going to describe it. So maybe when you think of eternal life, you define it as heaven. Eternal life is heaven. Or maybe when you define eternal life, you think of it as immortality of life after death, wherever that be. But to really answer this, let's turn to John 17, 3 to define eternal life. And it defines it as this. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. So what's eternal life? Eternal life is knowing Jesus, is knowing God. The man was so focused on trying to figure out what information he could get from Jesus that he didn't realize that the goal isn't what we can get from Jesus, but it's to be with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And this is why we go on about the fullness of life that Jesus offers with him right here and right now. We don't have to wait for the future. We don't have to wait until we die to be with Jesus. We can be with him right here, right now, in this moment and in the next. Eternal life is readily available. Jesus is just asking, do you want to get to know me? Do you want to be with me? And in this intimate moment with the man, when Jesus looked at him with love, he's offering him eternal life in that moment, saying, come, leave all that's in the way of getting to know me, of receiving this gift, and just come and be with me. But unfortunately, after the man hears Jesus' request, it says that he walks away sad, to which Jesus responds with, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples are amazed. Okay, not a good kind of amaze, like, yeah, no, like, shocked, like, oh, that's not good. Yeah, bummer, dude. (laughs) Here the disciples see the pinnacle of achievement, a man blessed by God who would no doubt go to heaven and who had evidence of God's blessing by his wealth, and Jesus says, man, it's going to be tough for that guy. And it's important to note that this doesn't mean that if you're wealthy, you automatically can't make it to heaven, as some people have. Uh, interpreted it as. The comment is showing is that the elite of their society, the pinnacle of what it means to be honored by God, to love God, that the elite of their society aren't any better off at attaining eternal life than those without wealth or God's supposed blessing. He's breaking down the status barriers. And at this point, the disciples' world is falling apart, and then Jesus makes it even more intense. He's like, actually, it's not even tough, it's impossible. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were even more amazed, more shocked, more in disbelief, and they asked, then who can be saved? Who? There's been some debate about the camel analogy and whether it's meant to be taken literally or not, and I could go off on a tangent and explain some other interpretations, but I won't. Um because then I get sidetracked and it'd be awkward. But have you seen the size difference between a camel and a needle? (laughs) Yeah? I don't know. Camels are like, well, I've never seen one in person, not going to lie. I've only seen them on a screen, so I've only seen them as this big. But they're really big. Needles are really small. The camel was the largest Palestinian animal they knew of, and the eye of a needle was the smallest known object to them. They didn't know about atoms or molecules or anything about that. It's not just difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. There's no chance. It's impossible. There's no way. Not even one in a million, one in a billion, one in a trillion, one in 400 trillion. No chance. 
There's absolutely no way that this man can earn eternal life, and it is absolutely impossible for you and I to do the same thing, no matter how good we are. And in this moment, the disciples were feeling shocked and helpless. In this moment, they were very concerned for their own salvation. If this man, the prime example of what it means to be a holy man, someone who loved God and was loved by God and who was a good man, isn't enough to achieve eternal life, then what hope was them for them? What hope is there for us? And to this, Jesus replies with words of hope. He says, well, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. Now, I feel like many of us have a tendency to use this phrase as an excuse to get more, to achieve more, like, I've definitely been guilty, like, oh, all things are possible with God. I forgot to study with that test, but I'll pass. All things are possible with God. It's fine. Or, oh no, my family's coming over for the weekend, and I've just been watched, binged watched Disney Plus all day today and haven't cleaned the house. They're going to be over in five minutes, but all things are possible with God. It's fine. They won't notice. When we use this phrase in context such as this, it's all about how God can help us with our own personal stuff. And he can. But this isn't what Jesus is talking about. Because when we do that, okay, get this. I worked really hard on this. You ready? Because when we do that, it's very me-focused instead of he-focused. Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, corny, but it rhymes, so it's legitimate. Um, Jesus isn't talking about how God can help us to achieve more or to acquire a bunch of stuff. What it's really about is that despite the things we accumulate or treat with priority over Jesus, we can still receive eternal life through him. Jesus is not saying that wealth is inherently bad. Wealth is wealth. It's neutral. What's bad is if we start to worship it to allow it to take priority over Jesus, whether that's actual finances or anything else. The stuff we use as a barrier between us and him, something that takes up all of our time, all of our affection, all of our loyalty and priority, is the stuff he will ask us to give up. Then Peter does what Peter does best, and he speaks up, saying, but we have left everything to follow you. To which Jesus replies, well, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Peter here seems to think like he's almost, he's almost speaking in a panic, saying, but don't forget all the stuff we've done for you. Sure, this rich guy, like, you know, he walked away, but we've given up everything for you. Doesn't that earn us a spot? Don't forget about all of our sacrifices we've made for you. They just heard Jesus' words, and now they're scared. And Jesus' response shows that Christians in this life will experience both blessings and suffering. And again, quoting William Lane, puts it, Jesus' response defines Christian existence in terms of promise and persecution. And history is the interplay of blessedness and suffering. Jesus is saying that even though there will be tremendous sacrifice in this current time and persecution along with it, there will also be goodness and it will be made complete in the age to come. When the kingdom of God is fully actualized. He's actually showing us what an anti-prosperity gospel looks like. That even though we can and will receive blessings from God, we are not free from persecution and are very likely to receive that in abundance as well. That following him does not free us from trials, but rather lets us journey with him through it. And then he finishes with this last statement, but many who are first will be last and the last first. And this statement right here reveals the upside-down kingdom that God is inviting us to be a part of. Just as we may have believed and the people of Jesus' day believed, we may think that the kingdom belongs to the holiest, the noblest, the greatest, the most important people, but in reality, none of that matters when it comes to eternal life in the upside-down kingdom of God. None of it matters. The rich man was first in all aspects, but the reality of the situation shows that all of his qualifications did not make him first, but the barriers he had in place that he was unwilling to drop were actually what put him last. Jesus doesn't care about who's the first or the greatest. The thing he cares about is you. That's what he cares about. See, this guy thought he had earned his way into eternal life by greatness, that he had achieved enough, and in doing so, he forgot that the God he was working for so hard 
isn't a God of expectations, but a God of grace. So in short, the moral of the story is not that we are called by Jesus to throw absolutely everything we own, all of our finances away and follow him. Like, sure, maybe you will be, and good luck. But some of us won't be. What this whole story is about is actually about how the desire, the obsession to be great, to be successful, to be worthy, things we put in place, we take priority, that take priority over Jesus, or what will keep us from the kingdom. The gift of eternal life is all about grace, that out of the grace and the goodness of God, he's willing and wanting us to receive this gift. We can't earn it because it makes it all about us, and there's no person in existence that's good enough or successful enough to earn their way. But here's the good news, Stony Plain Alliance Church. The key to Jesus and eternal life is all about following the invitation of Jesus to receive his gift of grace. It's about us accepting the invitation to be with him. It's about leaning into the grace that he wants us to experience. Eternal life defined as by being with Jesus and getting to know him is not something we have to earn, but rather is a gift, something that we can freely receive, and is something that Jesus is graciously offering to each and every one of us. No matter our accomplishments, no matter our failures, no matter our victories, no matter our shortcomings. Man did everything he could, and by human definition he did, and even went above and beyond. But like Jesus said, it's impossible to achieve. It's like the camel in the eye of a needle. And that's where receiving comes into play. Trying to achieve our way makes it about us, while receiving it makes it about Jesus and his goodness. Maybe realizing that there's nothing we can do about our salvation or achieving eternal life, it's not in our hands, maybe that's scary for you. (laughs) Maybe you're someone who likes to be in control, and being out of control, knowing that there's nothing you can do to achieve it, it's all up to Jesus. Maybe that's scary. Maybe that brings anxiety. Maybe that brings fear. Or maybe you don't believe it. Maybe you're on the complete opposite side. Maybe you're like, this is just too good to be true. He can't just give it to me. Maybe there's some negative things in your life that could eat away at your soul and are causing a barrier between you and Jesus. You know, um, shame is something I've dealt a lot with in my life. Uh, I've sunk to areas that I never thought I'd sink to and areas that are so dark that um, I don't want to go back to again. And living in that condition makes it near impossible to believe that Jesus is just offering life with him. You know, I tried so hard to be a better person out of fear of rejection or trying to atone for past mistakes, to do all that I could to help earn back my value and my worth about myself, to work hard enough to um, make myself a better person. And maybe this is your story too, and maybe it's not. Maybe you have a different motive to try and prove yourself to Jesus. Either way, if you believe that you have to prove yourself to Jesus, think again, because that's not true. (laughs) It goes back to agape. He loves you unconditionally, and there's nothing you can do to change that. So maybe, just maybe, this is an invitation from Jesus to experience freedom from trying to achieve, to hand over your fears to him, all your feelings of being constrained to earn, to prove yourself, and instead embrace his freedom by saying, this is not something to achieve, but to receive. And I want to receive it freely from you. Let me put my salvation into your hands and rest knowing that you are good. So as I wrap up, I want to invite up the worship team. Um, I just have a few questions I want you guys to think about. So as we talk about this, um, I guess the question is this then, Stony Plain Church, all you beautiful people here. What's the barrier between you and the kingdom? What might Jesus be asking you to give up so that you can receive his gift of eternal life to know him and to rest in his presence? What in your life is so precious to you that's stopping you from responding to his invitation? Maybe it's something material like money. Maybe it's something more abstract like trying to better your reputation, your success, to achieve greatness or honor or recognition, to make a lasting imprint in society. Maybe it's even something negative that's stopping you shame. 
whatever it is, just take time over the week, over the next few months, over the next few minutes to ask Jesus what it might be. And then I'd encourage you to try and take the step to leave it behind and follow his invitation to accept his gift of grace. It's here and available. Are you ready to receive it? What gift, what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more. steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can see
come to the table now. That's loud. We're going to come to the table now. And Jesus here is offering a choice. He didn't force a rich man to give up everything and follow him, but rather he gave the man two options. To keep everything and reject his invitation to be with him, or to leave behind everything that was barrier in his life to join Jesus, to accept the invitation, and to receive the gift of eternal life, to follow a path that will be full both of trials and blessings, but have our Lord Jesus be with us every step of the way. We have that same choice today. We can respond to the call of Jesus like the man. We can say no. Or we can change the narrative, break down those barriers and say yes. So let's take a few moments to listen to Jesus and ask, Jesus, help me lay everything down that might be stopping me from receiving the gift of grace that you want to offer. So we're going to participate in communion now. Uh, if you guys have not grabbed any of the cups, they are on the back tables right there. You can feel free to go up and grab one. Um, I won't point you out or anything. But communion is where we come to experience intimate fellowship with Jesus. It's a time where we join together in an act of remembrance to meet him in this space and ask him, invite him into our lives at this moment. Um, and just like the story, you have a choice. If you want to participate, then by all means, please do. There are no prerequisites. If you have desire to receive the gift of grace from him today, then I'd strongly encourage you to listen to the call and join. And if you don't desire to receive the gift of grace, then that's okay too. You have the choice to say no. You don't have to participate. But for those joining, let's join in communion and come to the table of grace. Jesus isn't expecting us to have everything together, isn't expecting us to be the best or the most successful or the most honorable. Instead, he's inviting us to come as we are. We don't have to try and earn anything, but rather come to him, accept the call and receive his gift of grace and enter into the freedom that our salvation is out of our hands and is in his and his alone. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's drink together Jesus' blood that was poured out for us so that we may freely accept and receive his gift of grace. So many reasons Too many to count To say that I love you worship you now cause your love is perfect and your heart is kind I'm yours forever forever you're mine sing this out, Jesus the anthem Jesus the anthem of my heart Jesus, the anchor of my soul, I'm overwhelmed by all you are. Oh, how I love you. Call me beloved, and you call me friend. Your grace is unworthy. You welcome me. Now all that I long for And all that I need Is to be in your presence Forever I fall at your feet Jesus Jesus the anthem of my heart Jesus the anchor of my soul I'm over 
If you'd like prayer this morning, uh, our prayer team is in the back corner over there, and uh, we invite you to come for prayer for anything you'd need um, as well. If you're wondering uh, about baptism, or you'd like to get baptized, or you're wondering when we're going to have a baptism again, we're going to have baptisms next Sunday, and so if you'd uh, want to be there, make sure you're there, and also if you're wondering about getting baptized yourself, come talk to myself or one of the other pastors afterwards, and we'd love to tell you more about baptism. And then uh, we'll see you tonight at 6 if you want to come. And as we prepare to go, would you have your eyes open to see the goodness of God? His goodness he's extending to you, his goodness he's inviting you into. May you find in Christ there's no sense of earning, achieving, or impressing, but instead unfailing love. May you go in this love, being a conduit of the love of Christ to your neighbors, your friends, your family, your co-workers, and all you come in contact with. Go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ.